on this episode of The Darker Side of Boxing. We're telling you the story of James Butler Jr. and the Kellermans. A story about families from different walks of life who would come together to try and take on the world. But after an appalling incident inside of the ring, things would soon start to spiral out of control and lead to the end of a talented life. fans this is another great episode for the darker side of boxing another story that you may or may not have heard about and it's certainly one i've never really even heard about being a boxing fan pretty much all my life it's not one that i've ever really followed and this is the perfect opportunity for myself uh, and johnston to really break this one down to the nitty-gritty and the details of it and the story of james butler and the kellermans is a very intriguing one uh, and a very sad one at the same time and we're going to be breaking down this episode in various parts as we do with the darker side of boxing but before we do that I just need to let everybody know. You're going to be listening to an episode here that's going to have nitty-gritty details about horrific acts that took place inside and outside of the ring. So if you're a bit squeamish or you have any issues with foul language or you're just generally offended by anything, then this is probably the moment to switch off from this episode because when we get into these episodes, this is when we go full hell for leather on the people that are perpetrating these crimes and obviously giving all that empathy and sympathy to the victims and the victim's family in all of these episodes. So if this is not for you, please switch off now. We're going to jump in to the story of a guy called James Butler Jr. Just a little bit of background about this fella. He was a boxer. He was a decent amateur and he moved into the program. So we're going to go through all that. I'm going to start at the very beginning of his childhood uh, and describe some some moments in his life uh, throughout his career. And obviously, as you mentioned earlier, Sean, the friendship he does have with the Kellermans. So it's a slightly different route. It's not just about one particular guy. It's about other another family as well from a completely different angle as well. You've got two families in completely two different walks of life in terms of how they were brought up and and what they became. Um, so this story is literally, it, it's it's compelling, as they always are. And it's a story that is very sad. And you rightly put this game at the beginning there, Sean, because there are some graphic material in this, as, as they always are in the darker side of boxing. So we're going to start from the early life of James Butler Jr., who was born on December 18, 1972. And he was raised in the projects of Harlem, New York, to an absent father and a party-loving mum. Now, as a teenager in the 80s, he roamed the Harlem projects at a time when crack cocaine was cheap and violence on streets was basically considered normal routine. And just to show you how bad New York was during this time, if you didn't already know, during the 70s and the 80s, here are some quotes from those that lived through it. And this is a guy called L.B. Tillman, who's 43 years old, a resident of Marcy Houses in Brooklyn since 1975. And he said, when the crack epidemic came, it took over. There were fights every day, shootouts every day, people playing music outside of your building to get someone out to fight. Ernley Jenkins, who was 70 years of age, and he was a resident at the Grant Houses in Manhattan since 1976. And he said, every place you step, you would step on a crack bottle back in the 80s. In Grant, You would be afraid to walk down the steps because you had a bunch of crack bottles and they get stuck to the grooves of your shoe. So there's two different guys that that basically lived in this society at that time. And it basically just describes the sort of upbringing that James Butler Jr. was beginning to face from very early in in his life. Now, to say it was a tough upbringing for James would be an understatement, especially with no father figure present and an absent mother. Now, at a very young age, James would be left alone at home with his younger brother, Aaron, while his mum would be out for days drinking 
and taking drugs. Now, James's mum, Val Vagadson, once said in a telephone interview, James was a very difficult child to raise. He was always so quiet, so withdrawn. He would sit there and I would say to him, Mummy loves you, tell me what's wrong. And James would just sit there all quiet, locking everything upstairs there in the brain and not letting anything out. Now, she did admit that she wasn't always there for him when he needed her. And she said, Ma was hanging out, you know what I mean? I don't think James liked that. Ma out partying. Oh, God, thank you. That's terrible, I'm laughing. But you can quite easily get from those quotes that they're Velva. She just wasn't there. She wasn't there for her two boys. And, and as I just, you know, just describing what, what the society was like at the time, it wasn't good for those two young boys living in that house and literally crack out on the street. And, and you know, they they were a very poor family. They had no money uh, living in a, that unsafe environment where crack and crime were the only way out. And, and James and Aaron were in and out of foster care during the even tougher times, but it did give James the opportunity to open up to his closest friends that he did make. And he did say about his mum, and he said that his basically his mum would slap him around a little bit. Now, Vel- Velva did deny it, but she did say, maybe I was too strict with him, too stern. I don't know. I wanted my sons to be strong because the world is cruel. It's chaos. If you are weak, you fall. I believe James fell. Now, funny enough, Velva never actually approved of boxing, uh, considering that she did give him the odd whipping here and there. And she never once showed up to any of Butler's professional or amateur fights. Well, that's a contradictory statement, if I've ever heard one there from the mum, <laughs> basically saying maybe I was too strict with him, too stern, and she didn't want them to grow up, basically being wimps and pusses. But yet it was all right for her to go around beating the shit out of them whenever she fought. These are the types of stories that become very frustrating when you get absent parents or parents that are basically in denial of the way they've brought the the children up. Now, for James, we move into the beginning of his boxing career now. And boxing trainer Alexander Newbold from Harlem, better known as Ness, laid eyes on James for the first time when he was kicking a glass door at a fast food restaurant on 155th Street and 8th Avenue. Ness told him, kid, you should be boxing. You've got a lot of anger in you. Now, James showed up at the Times Square Athletic Club the very next day. Bob Jackson, who was also a trainer at the same gym, remembered the first time he saw James in the ring saying he looked as if somebody had just stolen something from him and it might have been you. Due to his natural power, he was nicknamed James the Harlem Hammer Butler. One week before his 18th birthday, he spent 20 days in prison for petty larceny. But at 19, James Butler was able to start challenging his aggression and behaviour when he kick-started a career in boxing and it began fighting as an amateur in 1991. Now, James was asked once why he wanted to become a boxer and he said, in his own words, I wanted to be something in society. So growing up, I always wondered what I could be. I used to get into street fights and hit people. I went to gym to learn boxing and that was it. It didn't take Butler, Butler long to make his mark. And on Friday, March 13th, Friday the 13th in 1992, James Butler defeated Nathaniel Shepard at Times Square to win the New York Golden Gloves novice title at £156. What a great start that was for him for his boxing career. Uh, and Friday great the 13th start. of all of all days as well. <laughs> Friday that maybe that's an maybe that's an omen as to, to what's to come in the future. Now this is where we'll we'll switch it up a little bit now, and obviously we put a bit of context to James Butler's career. This is where we now introduce the Kellermans. Now, of course, you guys may know, listening, of Max Kellerman, but we are discussing not just Max, but his brother Sam in this story. Now, at the age of 20, James Butler meets Sam Kellerman at the Times Square Athletic Club, and Sam was the brother of Harry, Jack, and Max Kellerman, who is, of course... What I've just said, we someone we all know, commentator, someone who's big in the boxing industry. He's been a personality on the TV for quite a long time. So Sam actually followed in the footsteps of his older brother Max by becoming what Sports Illustrated described as a self-taught Shakespeare scholar. Now Sam had directed three plays off Broadway, written and directed a play titled The Man Who Hated Shakespeare, and Sam was highly intelligent and attended Manhattan's elite Stuyvesant High School. Now, in a brilliant article by Gary Smith of Sports Illustrated, he obtained a teacher's report on Sam 
that put him in the highest regard, saying, 10,000 students and 34 years have passed since my first day as a teacher, and I cannot recall one student of this quality, intelligence and talent. Sam is someone who our world should be proud to know as an example of what humans are all about and of the heights we can attain. Here he is, Sam Kellerman, the best of 10,000. Now his teacher wasn't the only one to speak of Sam in such admiration. His two younger brothers looked up to both Max and Sam and Jack, his brother, said, Max was Malcolm X and Sam was Martin Luther King Jr. Harry said, Max taught us to be men Sam taught us to be human. And their mother, an artist, Linda Kellerman, compared her sons in a religious sentiment, saying, Max was Moses and Sam was Jesus. So Sam and Max, they weren't just brothers. They had that relationship that was, was so strong. They were very, very good friends as well as being brothers. Yeah, and then, I mean, what a great review from his teacher. I mean, wow. I mean, the best of 10,000. That is uh, some statement to say, uh, which, which shows you just at a very young age, just how articulate Sam was. Now, all four brothers were actually schooled by their father, Henry, and grandmother, Esther, in public speaking from the moment they could talk. And in fact, they were actually given every opportunity to progress in life. The complete opposite, of course, to James Butler Jr. Two completely separate upbringings, but yet they forged a friendship, which we will go into. Now, one day, Sam demonstrated his high level of intelligence while playfully debating with Max on what sports means to people. And they used to get into several debates, obviously highly intelligent, and they enjoyed getting into these debates. And this is what Sam said in in this great analogy. And he said, sports is man's joke on God, Max. You see, God says to man, I've created a universe where it seems like everything matters, where you will have to grapple with life and death, and in the end, you'll die in a way, and it won't really matter. So man says to God, oh yeah, Within your universe, we're going to create a sub-universe called sports. One that absolutely doesn't matter, and we'll follow everything that happens in it as if it were life and death. And once again, just to show you just how articulate Sam was, a fantastic analogy on what sport is all about for all of us. That's a brilliant analogy, and if you've not already heard that before, then... I'm sure that will probably open your eyes a little bit and open your ear lugs as well because it's it's really good, really good analogy and something I've enjoyed looking at when doing the research for this particular episode. Now, Max was inspired to box after watching Muhammad Ali on TV, but after spending a few years in the gym, his career was actually derailed by his worried mother following the death of Duke Con Kim on national television in 1982. That infamous fight against Ray Boom Boom Mancini. Now Max took to box the boxing magazines instead, memorising five magazines a week and compiling top ten lists from every division in every year. So armed with an artillery of knowledge on boxing, his father, Henry, paid $27 for 16-year-old Max to use the Manhattan Neighbourhood Network studio where he showcased his excellent knowledge on boxing. Now, he was so impressive that he was given his own weekly show, Max on Boxing, where he was able to make a name for himself. He even appeared on the David Letterman show and visited Dustin Hoffman for dinner at his house. Now, it wasn't long before Sam, Harry and Jack would learn the ropes in the control room and help with the production of the show. When Max moved on Sam and Jack took the reins for a show that lasted nine years, the four brothers would call themselves Masahaya Inc., the same name, that their dad had coined when they were little nippers. You can see these guys, uh, I mean, just from Max, I mean, obviously uh, appearing on the Letterman show and, and going to visit Hoffman. I believe Hoffman phoned in when he went on for the first time. He, he ranted on about how Mike Tyson could knock out this guy and that guy. And, and he literally rolled off so much information in a matter of half an hour that the, the phone lines were blowing up and they really loved it. And, and obviously, as you can tell, he was a hit and Max... You know, obviously not being able to box, he, he loved he loved his history. And he, you, you, there's no doubt, I mean, we watch him today, the guy has a wealth of knowledge on boxing. So we'll move on now back to James and, and also to Sam and, and when they actually ignited their friendship. Now, when Sam turned 18 in his senior year, he actually stayed in an apartment on Times Square and it was there when he stumbled across that Times Square athletic gym. 
Now, Sam wanted to learn the basics so he could defend himself and help out his two brothers or his two younger brothers if they ever fell into trouble, just like Max had done before he had left to go to for Connecticut College. And so, so Max wasn't around and obviously Sam wanted to sort of make sure he looked after his younger brothers. So obviously he wanted to learn how to defend himself. Now, boxing trainer Ness welcomed Sam to the gym and immediately threw him in the ring with a guy who was two years older, five inches taller and 30 pounds heavier. As explained by Gary Smith of Sports Illustrated, he said, got your mouthpiece? Ness asked Sam. Sam froze and asked why. You're boxing him next. No way. Man, that guy can punch, said Sam. Then after the sparring session, he got an absolute pounding during the sparring session, by the way. Obviously, that guy was James Butler Jr. He did give Sam a bit of a pace in the sparring session, but, you know, he held his own. And after the sparring session, Sam asked Ness, you think I could hit like the hammer? And his response was simple. People are born with that pop, but I'll teach you balance and defense. You won't get hurt. And Sam basically joined Ness and his stable of boxers along with the hammer. And he was nicknamed, or he was given the nickname, the baby-faced assassin. And to be fair, Sam wasn't, you know, he was never going to be a professional boxer, even going to amateur boxing. It was literally just for him to be able to defend himself. And coincidentally, Harry actually got jumped at school. And uh, Sam, it was he called his brother Max, and Max sort of said to him, you know, who wasn't around, you know, you need to step up kind of thing. So Sam ended up, approaching this Albanian bully and he bashed him up actually opened up a cut on the kid's head but true to form Sam raced into a deli grabbed a fistful of napkins and helped stop the bleeding before comforting the bully that he just bashed up again it just shows you that you know no matter what you find on Sam Kellerman this guy was just a, a lovely person and there's no other way of putting it he he will go into a bit more detail for the stuff he did and he was just a lovely chap well, so far, I've really enjoyed hearing about Sam because I like his analogies. I like the fact that he went out to defend himself. He stuck up for his brother. And at the same time, he had that empathy to go back to the bully and say, look, you know, you've had your ass handed to you here, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to take it any further. Let's just let's just get over it. And that, that's kind of how society in some respects used to be, where people were able to resolve their issues sometimes it'd just end up in a fist fight that fist fight would end and the respect would be there between one another and unfortunately that society is just well and truly gone now so it's, it's really good to hear about a man like sam who who was that type of guy now it was during this time in the early 90s that james and sam struck up an unlikely friendship both finding a common interest for the love of hip-hop now james at first was reserved about sam who seemed overly nice but what James didn't know was that Sam could actually rap. Now, after dissecting all 37 of Shakespeare's plays, both Sam and Max would rap battle in the parks and hold their own. According to Sports Illustrated, Sam dropped a verse while in the gym and James overheard. That line isn't the original, that's Pax. Tupac is my man. After training, both would head down to the 42nd Street and spend time window shopping and reciting rhymes. And James was always taken back by Sam's generosity. He would feed the homeless, and he supposedly gave a homeless person the shirt, quite literally, off his back. Now, years later, Sam directed a play to raise money for the families of the 9-11 victims. And James was so inspired that he gave part of his $20,000 fight purse to help the same cause. A fight, of course, which we will be speaking about later on during the course of the episode. Now, occasionally, though, Sam would be reminded of James's temper, and after an attempt to hook his pal up with a girlfriend backfired, Sam told Ness, Man, I hope James never snaps on somebody. He's like Tyson. Ness spoke of their friendship. I believe what James always saw in Sam was this other world he knew nothing about. Sam was rich. He was this white Jewish kid from downtown. We were uptown. But Sam accepted him for him. All Sam saw in James was a guy he could help, so he helped him. Wow, just it, what what <laughs> I can't have lost for words with this guy, Sam. He, he really was just a, a, an unbelievable person. I mean, how, how can you dissect 37 or all 37 of Shakespeare's plays? I mean, the pair of them, and then they were using them in their rap battles. And, and to be fair, and you know, I haven't, we haven't put it in here, but they weren't bad uh, from when they were doing their battles. Uh, from what I'm hearing, you know, they get a few oohs and ahs. 
and they couldn't quite believe that these little white boys were had a bit of a rhythm. Um, you know, they were highly intelligent. But I do wonder, I mean, these two sort of posh kids knocking around with some unsavoury characters and they didn't, <laughs> no, you never heard of them getting mugged. They seemed, they, they held their own. And Max actually used to walk around with a, a bit of a, a baseball bat with him as well, just in case up his sleeve. So, you know, he, he was he was another one. He was never going to take no shit. So we're moving now to, to the amateur career, pro debut and a certain music video. So on Thursday, April 6, 1995, James Butler continued his impressive amateur career when he defeated Alexander Bouquet in the 156 pound weight class to win his second Golden Gloves title in the open category. So it's a better category and, and, and again, two Golden Gloves titles. What a fantastic amateur, really. I mean, can't get much better than that. Now, in the same year, Butler won a place in the US team in the dual meet against Finland on September 15, where he lost by disqualification to a guy against Uri Kohonen at the Hotel Sandik Rosendahl in Finland. Now, his amateur career did end successfully with a bronze medal at the Nationals. He got a bronze medal in that. Um, so following his accomplished amateur career, James Butler turned pro on October 18, 1996, making his full debut in a fight he actually couldn't recall at the Bronx. And it was getting, he actually got the first round stoppage victory over fellow debutant Eddie Johnson in the middleweight division. Now, when asked in an interview about that pro debut, Butler said, can't remember much. But I remember amateur fights before that. I went to Puerto Rico and knocked out WBO champ Daniel Santos and lost a controversial decision to current WBC super middleweight champion Byron Mitchell. Byron was a little stronger, but I like to fight again now at professional to get my revenge. So two weeks later in Connecticut, Butler beat Derek Whitley, who was a three and two guy by a majority decision to end the year. But in January 1996, his pro career took a dent at the Yonkers Raceway in New York. He actually lost on points over four rounds to Richard Grant, who was one and one in their first meeting. Their second meeting will be a defining night in Butler's boxing career. Now, James and Sam's friendship started to go beyond just linking up after training sessions. Even when Sam stopped attending the gym, Sam and Max were offered to produce a single by Roughhouse Records, a label of Columbia Records. They actually created a rap single called Young Man Rumble, and you can see part of that video on <laughs> YouTube. If you go and put Young Man Rumble on YouTube, you actually can go and find this. Now, Sam, being his usual kind self, uh, wanted to help his mate out with a little bit of extra money while just starting out in the pros, and he asked him to appear on his video. But due to the long hours and low pay, James left before the shoot was done. The two remained as buddies even when their paths went separate ways, although Max had concerns with James's attitude and temper, but stuck by his brother's wishes to stand by his liability of a mate. Sam was one of the biggest cheerleaders, pushing his brother Max to promote Butler on television, and Max did. And this is what Max had to say. Sam believed in him. Sam believed in his future as a fighter. Once you had Sam in your corner, you had him for life. So not only is he a nice guy, he will look after his mates as well. And 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 by the sounds of it, the elderly. He, he enjoyed going around to to the elderly's houses and literally help them with their shopping and, and then have chats with them. I mean, this kid is just an absolute breath of fresh air. This this guy was going, he could have been the president of the country by the sounds of it. He was just a, a, a fantastic human being and uh but back to James Butler and his professional career continued. Uh, obviously, still reeling from that defeat to Grant. Butler does reel, reel off a 12 straight victories from April 1997 to July 1999, picking up his most credible win over a guy called Murky Sozo, who was a 33 8 and 2 with a second round stoppage, and taking his pro career to 14 and 1 with nine knockouts. Now, it was this victory at the Hampton Beach Casino where it was on the same bill as Irish Mickey Wald that got Butler a shot at the US BA Super Middleweight title against Bryant Brannan, who was 20 and 1. And his sole defeat actually came to the hands of uh, Roy Jones Jr. He knocked him out in the second round, I believe. Now, the fight what happened at the Farm Bureau building in Indianapolis and was actually broadcast live on ESPN2. 
Butler went on to knock out New Jersey's BB Brennan in the seventh round before moving on to defend the title twice against Arthur Allen and Jose Spearman, both by knockout in the second and seventh rounds, respectively, to go 17 and 1 with 12 inside the distance. Then on March 24, 2001, Butler is put on the same bill as the undefeated IBF super middleweight champion Sven Otke in Germany. Butley fights for the first time at light heavyweight and outpoints fellow American Jerry Williams, 11-13-1, over eight rounds. So at this point in his career then, things are starting to take a, a massive upward trajectory for him because he's fighting on the same bill as Sven Otka and obviously we know Sven Otka at that period of time was, was a formidable super middleweight champion. We know his fight with, with Robin Reed is one we've, we've discussed in the past and this guy was potentially being lined up to fight James Butler. So you know, you look at look at where he's at at the moment. He's pushed himself into contention to fight one of the most feared champions in the division. We've got to also remember at this this moment in time as well, or this era of boxing, a certain Joe Calzaghe was a world champion in the super middleweight division as well. Now, six months later, and James Butler actually finds himself back in Germany at the same venue in Madgenburg, now called the GTAC Arena, at the top of the bill, fighting for the IBF World Super Middleweight title against Sven Otka, who's 23-0. Unfortunately for James Butler, he was outclassed and outboxed by Otka and loses a 12-round unanimous decision. Two judges had it 118-109 and the third scored it 119-108, all in favour of Otka. Now, a downbeat Butler returned to New York when tragedy struck 10 days later on September the 11th, 2001, when the World Trade Centers were hit in a terrorist attack, resulting in 2,977 fatalities and over 25,000 injuries. Something that will always stick with me, you know, just mentioning, mentioning obviously 9-11, it's, it's something that I don't think any of us will ever forget, even as, as UK fight fans, even as people from the UK. I still remember where I was when I heard the news this terrorist attack had taken place. That's how significant this has been uh, in the history of the world, regardless of what you think really happened. But this was something that at the time caused so much controversy and boxing and everything else sport wise just took a back seat oh mate you say you remember where you was I think I, I know for a fact where I was I was working in Greenwich uh, I was what 18, 19 working in Greenwich in a printer's firm um, and I heard it on the radio I remember thinking I remember hearing on the radio the first plane they believed it was an accident and then literally while we was all listening in shock the next one went in it, it just sent shivers down my spine I mean I think we've all sat down and watched all the documentaries and all the, the different conspiracy theories about it but there's no denying it is quite simply one of the most tragic things I've ever seen in my lifetime. Incredible moment. It, it was just so sad. And to be living in New York at that time, as James Butler was, you know, he's come back, he's damn beat. He's just lost his world title fight. And then that happens. Wow. I mean, it's not a nice place to be. Now, uh, we'll move on to, we'll continue with, with Butler Jr. And, and the next fight for him was the Richard Grant rematch now that was two months later butler's given the chance to avenge that defeat against richard grant who was now 13 and 8 on a card that was billed as fighting for america a night of thanksgiving with all proceeds going to the twin tower fund james went in his favorite and before the fight he was actually interviewed by a u.s-based boxing agent ike emrazor and he said in his word this is what butler said he put a blemish on my record I had to kill myself to make that weight. I'll prove to him this time that that was a fluke. I wasn't 100% for that fight. My energy levels weren't there. He never hurt me. He just came in with his head. So I suffered cuts on both fires. I'm 168 pounds now stronger than ever. And that fight was held in New York at the Roseland Ballroom on November 23rd, 2001, live on ESPN2. And it went the 12 round distance. Look at the scorecards. Tommy Kazmarek scores about 96 to 94. Steve Weisfeld has a 97 to 93. That's the same score from Melvina Lathan, 97 93. All for the winner by unanimous decision. Richard the Alien Grant. So Butler's number eight ranking is going to take a hit. Richard Grant in the mild upset. A unanimous decision victory. Oh, look at this. Butler. Whoa! Butler. 
Butler just ran across Butler, the ring. Butler just went over there and sucker punched. Sucker punched and knocked out Grant. Oh, boy. Terrible. And the new, and the new commissioner, Ray Kelly, will do something very, very enforceful here. You want to talk about Zab Judah and his antics losing some money in a suspension. James Butler should never be allowed in the ring again. Absolutely. Never. That's assault. That is assault. He should be arrested on the spot. He should be arrested right on the spot. That is assault and battery. This will be the first test for the new commissioner, Ray Kelly, and I know that he will handle this the right way. What a punk. James Butler. Once that fight is over, the final bell rings, Butler removes his gloves, as most fighters do before walking to the centre of the ring to join the referee, Mike Ortega, and Grant for the official announcement. Now, all three judges gave the fight to Grant by unanimous decision. Moments after the decision was announced, Butler walked up to Grant as if to congratulate him. Then, out of nowhere, with his bare fist, Butler hit Grant in the jaw, sending him to the mat with blood spraying from his mouth. It was frantic in the ring and nobody could quite believe what had actually happened. Now, the commentator on ESPN was Bob Papa. He was screaming, and this is what he was saying. That's assault and battery. He should be arrested on the spot. What a punk. The police should come in here and arrest him, handcuff him. Now, Teddy Atlas, we know him as a very animated commentator. He was co-commentating on the fight and said this in an interview about Butler. I'm sure there were previous incidents prior to the post-fight knockout of Grant. If you trace it back... I'm sure there were other past acts of violence, or at least threats of violence. I knew he had gotten into some skirmishes in the gym where I was when he was training, but they never got to a level where he seriously hurt anybody. Some threats may have been made, but you see that sometimes in the gym. Usually, nothing comes of it. Oh, it is just a, a crazy moment. One of the most craziest moments I've ever seen in a boxing room to see this guy. He literally... It is just a full, full punch. You know, it's a, it's a bare-wristed punch, and and it was a cheap shot. It really was. And with, you know, it being so close to what's happened, you know, it's still raw. And you know, to be, he actually put up half of his money. You know, some, so I think there was a couple of Olympians that also fought on the bill that actually donated all their money that they were going to get for the proceeds to the charity. And 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 this was Grant, Grant and uh, Butler were both going to. I think they both gave half their proceeds as well to, to the charity. But I really, it, it, you just lost for words when you watch it. It is on YouTube. Seriously, if you haven't seen it, go and look at it. You can basically watch the whole fight if you want. It's not the best of fights. It's the after incident that is just crazy. And Grant was released from hospital around 4 a.m. the next day after being treated for a tongue injury. Now, his pr promoter, who was Jimmy Birchfield, said Grant's jaw had been knocked temporarily out of its socket and he received 26 stitches. Wow. He also said Grant had some loose teeth and was experienced severe headaches. He hadn't been able to eat since the fight. I've never seen anyone get hit with a punch like this. Blood squirting out of his mouth. He looked like he was dead. And I'll tell you what, he really did. It was dreadful. It really, it was literally, it was assault in the ring and it was, it was a terrible, terrible moment. Now, without question, it was an appalling act of violence. And with around 500 police officers, over 1,000 firefighters all in attendance, with all the proceeds being donated to the Twin Towers Fund to help New York rebuild after September the 11th, he makes this cowardly act so more inconceivable. All them dozens of people in the crowd at the time turned to Butler and began to chant, Cuff him! Cuff him! Cuff him! In the audience was police commissioner and head of the state of the Boxing Commission, Raymond W. Kelly, who immediately ordered a deputy boxing commissioner to suspend Butler and have him arrested. Now, Kelly was quoted after the fight as saying, if he had his preference, Butler would never fight in New York again. After charged with second degree assault and spending the night at the Rikers Island detention facility, Butler was then released the very next day. I can't believe that what actually happened in this particular incident. Again, we was having a chat outside of, of, of this episode. And when we were discussing our research for this episode, I, I couldn't believe I genuinely don't remember this happening. And I genuinely don't remember any of the this incident. And when we were going through everything, 
I couldn't believe it, and I still can't believe it, even now. It's something that still confuses me. The fact that when you watch this incident happen and take place in front of your eyes, all you're expecting is James Butler to go up to Richard Grant and just give him a hug and just say, you know what, congratulations, you've won the fight, you were the better man on the night. And instead, at one moment, he does look like he's about to do it, and then all of a sudden, he just cocks his right hand and just punches him square in the mouth. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe what had actually happened there. And, and oh man, I know we've seen a few minor scuffles in the ring, but something like that is just absolutely appalling. No, it really was. It was a disgusting moment. And, and I mean, we will go into what the reasons were because there was no real reason. It wasn't a dirty fight. It wasn't like Grant did anything. It, it, <laughs> we'll let Butler explain in a little while. Now, obviously, considering what's happening, everybody is... The 9 11 just happened. People, emotions are running high. They've just seen this. This is all for charity. Everyone's raving and telling out, you know, they believe Butler needs to be just suspended. His license taken away for life. He needs to go to prison. He needs this. It's assault. And, but the Kellerman brothers, Max and Sam, they both stand by Butler. And two days later, on November 28th, Max Kellerman wrote an article that defended Butler to not get a life suspension, which he headlined... Butler's suspension should be in proportion. Now, here are some extracts from a very reasonable argument. So this is every bit that come from Kellen. You can actually find this article. You can find Max Kellerman on James Butler and you'll find this. I've, I've just broke this down to give the summary of what Max was trying to say. Now, while everyone is caught up in the emotion of the moment, Butler's attack was an eerie and sickening sight. Let's take a step back and review what exactly happened. What steps have been taken in the past to deal with situations similar to this one and what the appropriate punishment might be. He went on to say Riddick Bow punched Larry Donald with a bare fist at a press conference promoting their match in 1994. Bow was neither led away in handcuffs nor handed a lifetime suspension for any state athletic commission. Mike Tyson bit a part of Evander Holyfield's ear off. Tyson's license was never taken from him permanently. Despite his pattern of bad behaviour, Zab Judah threw a corner stall after he was stopped in the second round against Costa Zoo. No one is talking about permanently suspending his licence. Now he says, and this is Max again, boxing is how Butler earns a living. It is how he pays his rent and buys his food. It is his day job and night job. To permanently den deny him his right to earn a living in his chosen profession, not because of a pattern of bad behaviour, but because of one momentarily stupid act, is simply not just. Imagine if the worst moment of your life, a moment you wish more than anything you could have back, was nationally televised. How much sympathy would you expect? Butler is not Mike Tyson, who can take a year off and live like a kin. He is a blue-collar guy who did a very stupid thing and has already began to pay for it dearly. One year, automatic, plus a substantial fine, that's plenty. Wow, that's that's a compelling statement from, from Max Kellerman. And he's very right in what he's written there. He is very right in what he's written. Whilst it's not condoned the actions of what actually took place, he's making comparisons to, to, to people that had higher profiles than James Butler Jr. And the way they were able to continue on their career without a lifetime ban from boxing. Now, the Kellerman brothers campaigned to get Butler his boxing licence back by both publishing articles, with Sam making it public knowledge that Butler was actually suffering with bipolar disorder. Now, their fight for Butler was a grand gesture, but he was eventually convicted to six months at Rikers Island and lost his boxing licence indefinitely. Now, Butler did make a statement on the assault and what he was actually thinking at the time and his mindset, and he said, Nothing went through my mind. That's the point. It was flatline. I was like dead. I went blank. After I hit Richard, everything clicked back on. It was like fist to jaw, then the noise and then the lights, and then I could hear and see all the people. It was like I literally was brain dead for a while. If I'd have been thinking, I would have just walked out the ring, maybe punched a locker or broken a door or something. That's that's a really compelling statement as well. <laughs> it really is, isn't it? I mean, how many times have we seen guys get pissed off with a decision and storm out of the ring before it's officially announced and then you see him kicking the door or kicking something when the camera zoom sort of go backstage? It happens. The fact that it was it was made public by Sam that 
he was suffering with bipolar disorder as well. And this article as well that Sam wrote, this quote that came from Butler uh, was actually in this article that Sam wrote, but you can't find it. Seriously, you just can't find it anywhere. Um, they've removed it and we'll go into why in a little while. But the fact he's suffering from bipolar disorder as well, maybe the commission didn't pick up on that. They didn't obviously see any sympathy because he went six, he, you know, he sent it to six months in Rikers Island, which is a, a bit of a, a tough prison as well. Compelling statement, isn't it, Sean? It really is. And you, you sort of, from what Max is saying and, and with the Kellermans and how they campaign for him and, and the bipolar disorder then, then becoming public, you sort of feel sorry for him. You do. You do feel a little bit sorry for him at this point because at this point of our story that we're telling, we know how much of a shitty life he's had and how much of a difficult upbringing and the fact that he's actually had people to stand by him and he's had a momentary lapse and he's been open and honest about it. Now, I'm not condoning that particular action on that night, but at the end of of it all, Max Kellerman summed it up very much correctly by comparing it, as I said earlier, comparing it to incidents that were, were just as bad, if not worse. I mean, Tyson biting Holyfield's ear, that was worse. He actually literally yeah. took a piece of his ear that he's never been able to get back. So he had one bad moment, and that bad moment led to... Uh, a complete downward spiral and it's it's only right now that we move into butler's release from prison and his actual return to boxing so in december of 2002 butler is released from rikers island after serving four months for good behavior now in an attempt to rebuild his life he attends anger management classes and starts taking medication for his bipolar disorder over the next months and years, his medication begins to develop side effects, including substantial weight gain, even going as high as 256 pounds, which is like over 100 pounds what his fighting weight was. After completing his anger management course, James moves to Vero Beach in Florida in January of 2003 to begin training with Buddy McGirt. Now in Florida, he met a girl named Chase Mariposa. And they would have a son together, Zaire. Now, Mariposa would later confess that Butler would often erupt into frightening fits of anger. These moments of rage would have stemmed from Butler's desperation to get back into boxing. But to do that, he needed to lose weight, which meant he couldn't take his medication. Now, James Butler spoke about the time he began to stop taking his meds and used physical therapy instead. And he said, you end up hating the people you love. They try to help you, but you flip on them for some small thing. I've taken the classes, read the books, I know what to do. You can reach a level where you don't need medication anymore. You just have to be strong-minded. The fight with Spinaki, um, that hurt me a lot. Uh, the World Trade Center, you know, I have friends that have friends of, of, of the, um, the terrible event, and um, I was there to console them, and... Um, it was just a lot on the plate, and this thing happens all the time. You know, I mean, boxers hit boxes after the fight. Uh, in sports that you're not supposed to fight, people hit people, and it, and it, it, nothing like this ever occurs, like where, where someone goes to jail, especially like a boxer against a boxer. I can understand, like, you know, if it was a civilian, someone that had no skills or knowledge of boxing on the street, and I hit them, I mean, that's something you go away for. You know what I mean? But someone that, you know, you, you um that has the same skills as you. You know, like when Tyson hit uh Miss Blood Green in the streets. Why he why he didn't go to jail? <laughs> <It's bullshit. laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, I think he needed to be taking his medication. I can understand what you know, physical activity and stuff, you know, it can do that with a mind, you know, it, it can channel your, your aggression. Without that, you tie yourself out. But by the sounds of it, his girlfriend was saying he's still erupting into frightening fits of anger. So clearly he needs to be on his meds, you know, no matter what. You know, I don't know how that works today with a bipolar. You could give a, a, a different type of drug. I mean, this is a few, several years. I'm what, 2000, this is like 17 years ago. So I'm sure medicine's developed enough now where you probably don't have this situation where you're ballooning up in in weight and obviously you know over 100 pounds he's fighting weight that's crazy isn't it i mean clearly he's gonna you know depression was kicking in as well so but six months later on june 2003 butler submits a request for a return to boxing and once again his biggest supporters are the kellerman brothers and with their influence his dreams come true and he was granted a boxing license once again 
Uh, Butler was overjoyed to be given a second chance, but he loses some points in his return against Thomas Reed, who was 31-12-1 in the Bronx. Four months later, he recalled back-to-back victories against Reggie Strickland with uh, an impressive journeyman career of 65 wins, 262 losses and 16 draws, and Dan Sheehan, who was 10 and 27. Now, Butler is given a great opportunity to throw himself back in the title mix against the genuine challenger that we all know, who's Omar Sheikha, who's 25 and 6, which was scheduled to take place on August 10th, 2004. And this was the, the light heavyweight limit. I believe the two fights he had previously to that, he fought a cruiserweight. So obviously the weight is gradually bringing down. He gets himself into quite a good shape under Buddy. Now the trouble is a month before this fight, Butler's preparations were sent into turmoil when he and Buddy McGurk had to part ways. Now it was apparently an amicable slit. And the reason for this was because Buddy had, uh, had to concentrate on his other fighter who had a world title fight coming up. So, you know, he had to make a decision and he, he, he dropped Butler out. So Butler did go on to fight Sheikha still. Uh, he put up a valiant display but lost by a split decision at the Essex County College in Newark. And this would be James Butler's last professional fight. Omar Sheik is a guy that went in with there uh, with Joe Calzaghi, so you know, we know he was no mug. We know he was no slouch. He'd been in there with world champions before now, so he'd done he'd done well to get himself into the position to to get a fight with with Sheik. But a lot of that probably hinges on the fact that the Kellermans had so much influence in boxing at the time, especially Max, of course, having that influence yeah. in boxing was probably the predominant reason why Butler, you know, was able to get himself into the position for for, for fights like that. They helped him get his license back he probably helped him get the relationship with buddy mcgurt they probably helped him also get the fights culminating in that last fight with omar Sheikha as well so he loses his last professional fight and we fast forward to september 2004 where the story starts to take a bit of a twisted turn now Butler claims that he was his home was actually destroyed by a hurricane and he arrives at sam kellerman's apartment in los angeles requesting for a place to stay now sam as we know was known for his kindness and allowed his long-term friend to stay on the condition that it would only be for a few days. Now, Butler's first trainer, Jack Stanton, once said, boxing was all James really had, boxing and Sam. Now, these days started to turn into weeks and James began to outstay his welcome. He was also suffering from persistent mood swings where he would be up one day and then down the next. One of Sam's friends was quoted as saying, Sam really wanted him out, but at the same time felt bad for him. Butler had no other friends, and he told him that everyone else had left his life. So a month passed by, and this time, Sam finally plucks up the courage to confront his old pal and ask him to find somewhere else to stay. When James refused, Sam threatened to call the authorities and have him removed, but that didn't work. You've got this big fella in, in, in your small apartment in, in Hollywood and he, he basically is not leaving. He's actually did mention to him as well that he's got a fight in California and that was part of the reason why he ended up on his doorstep. Obviously unstable, not taking his meds, not training either, clearly, because he's not really doing too much. He's just sort of sitting around in his apartment. Now he's in a situation where, you know, he's telling his friends, you know, he's in a difficult... What do you do with this guy, you know... I've, He's telling him to, he's even forcing, you know, saying to him, oh, no, I'm going to call the old Bill, and there's still nothing. You know, he, he, he can't he can't do it within himself to to get rid of him. So he's in a difficult situation, Sam. And, and one thing as well is that Butler, one thing he did say was he had a fight in California. So this fight was was due in, in like a few weeks. So Sam probably just assumed that, you know, he'd be, be out training, he probably wouldn't see him too much, and eventually would shoot off and go for this fight. So Butler clearly outstayed his welcome and Sam was at his wit's end with the whole thing. And, and he, but he ended up going out for dinner with, with an actress called uh, Claudia Salinas. And when they returned to his apartment, uh, James was actually watching the TV. And Sam says to him, this is what Claudia remembers, is I need to watch a game for the column I'm writing. And he was actually writing, I believe, for Fox News or Fox Sports. Claudia also remembered Sam saying to James can I change the channel? James basically abruptly says no. Sam was obviously pissed because he couldn't get the remote control from him. And he just says, yo, I've got work to do and I've got to see who wins so I can finish this story. And then 
James Butler replies, you can just wait until the commercial. So he's, he's intimidating him there. Sam then tells Claudia they should take a walk. And this is when he tells Claudia while they're having their walk that it's like this all the time. And, and Sam decided enough was enough and he was really going to force James to leave. And, and that was the last time Claudia see Sam. Now, it was mid-October and Max had become worried about his brother as he had not heard from him for almost a week, which was out of character. The last conversation was on October the 6th while Max was at the Yankee Stadium and the crowd drowned out Sam's voice. I can't hear you, Sam, shouted Max. I'll talk to you later. But he got home late and didn't call back. So now, five nights on, he calls Sam's friend, Steve Schinder, who lived locally and asked if he would go and check on his brother. On October the 17th, 2004, after no response from Sam's apartment, Mr. Schinder and an acquaintance broke through a window to gain access to his property. What they found was splatters of blood all over the walls and a lump under a blanket on the sofa. They immediately departed the apartment and called the police. When the police arrived, they found the body of Sam Kellerman, aged 29, who had been dead for several days. Right, so there was an attempt of arson, and next to Sam's body lay a bloody hammer. Now, the immediate suspect for the police was, of course, James Butler. Now, in telephone conversations with Butler's girlfriend, Mary Posa, she said Butler was feeling suicidal and experiencing manic episodes. When Butler called after Kellerman was found dead, Mary Posa said she advised him to contact the police. Butler also called his mother in New York and she recalled the conversation and she said he'd been drinking. He was mumbling, kept on saying over and over, I shouldn't have done what I did. I shouldn't have done what I did. Then he switched the conversation to his kid, how he wanted to see his kid. So what all we know at this time is it's clear he's, he's basically admitting it to his wife or his girlfriend sorry and his mother he's having his manic episode so apparently when this incident happened we'll say exactly what happened in a short time he left the apartment and he went for a stroll and he i believe he took sam's car as well but he did take his car and they were looking for for sam's car which they do eventually find in in a place where butler was now, three days after Sam's body was discovered, Butler turned himself into the police. He was arrested at the UCL Medical Centre, where he had gone to seek treatment for his bipolar disorder. Now, Butler was charged with murder and arson. He pleaded not guilty and did not post the $1.25 million bail. Now, according to the autopsy reports and a forensic analysis of the crime scene, Bjorn Dodd, a deputy district attorney in Los Angeles, said Kellerman was sitting in front of his desktop computer where he was struck from behind with a blunt object more than 30 times. The murder weapon was a bloody hammer which was found near Kellerman's body. Dodd said that detectives found bloody clothes belonging to Butler in the bathroom. Now, Butler attributed the blood to a suicide attempt. He sliced his wrist and ankles in Kellerman's bathtub. However, forensic scientists found that some of the blood on Butler's clothes was Kellerman's. And when detectives asked Butler about where his whereabouts were that night that Sam was killed, he said he had taken a walk around the block and found the body when he returned to the apartment. So Dodd reported that the physical evidence made a compelling case against Butler, but that one basic element, a motive, was missing. And Dodd said that the most unusual thing about this is not if Butler did it, but why he did it. There didn't seem to be any bad blood between them. What a crazy, crazy end to Sam Kellerman's life. That guy's a hero. That guy is an absolute hero. And I can't believe that his life was ended so tragically in, in that fashion as well. Everything that he'd done for, for James Butler Jr. And James Butler Jr. goes and takes his life like that. Now, I'm not going to justify what James Butler Jr. has done here. We understand that he, he was suffering a bipolar disorder at the time and we don't really know what other things were going on in his life at that time other than what we've been able to source for the episode. But it's quite obvious that when somebody you love so close to you is, is helping you out so much and you turn on them. And what's compelling about that is the statement he made about it a little bit earlier when we discussed it and we quoted what he said in that interview. 
and he's speaking about certain moments where he just completely switched off and what's going on around him. So did he commit this act whilst in that moment? As far as I'm concerned, what he did was unforgivable and is is an absolute disgusting human being for committing that type of a crime against somebody that had done nothing but help him in his own life. Absolutely. And and, and the fact that it's, it was over 30 times, I believe it was 32 times and basically what's happened is after that sort of going for a walk with, with Claudio, he's come back and he said, like, look, I've had enough. You know, you've got to go, James. Like, he's told him straight, you know, this you, you're sitting here, you, I need to do this report. So, And I believe he's had a row with him, set him straight kind of thing. And obviously James Butler hasn't liked what he said. And when he went back to the computer, he's literally started, you know, as they said, he was he was set in, his, in front of his desktop and he was putting a report together. And then that's when obviously... James is coming. Clearly, I mean, we said that, the butler statement where he just goes blank, and clearly that's what's happened. But to hit someone 30 times, he must have got tired at some point. He couldn't have just continually smashed him 30 times. I mean, it's, 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 it's so sick that someone that could strike someone once in the head with a hammer, but, you know, 32 times in, 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 in a rage is just incredible. And um, I mean, the crazy thing is as well, which we haven't mentioned, is there was a $300 postal money order to pay for James Butler's flight back to Florida, which was actually sent from his boxing manager, was David Berlin, and it actually arrived through Sam's mailbox on the day of the incident. So he had a ticket to go to Florida, back to Florida, and he would have seen that, and he still didn't go. So he had. He, it's not like he... He, he had to hitchhike all the way back to Florida. He had a ticket. He could have gone. You know what I mean? So that, that again, that's where it's sort. Of, that's where you sort of think to yourself. Well, obviously, stuff is not quite right with this guy. You know, and he, for him to the, the, what what I'm what I'm then finding is when he left the apartment, he's obviously it, apparently he attempted suicide. I mean, there's no marks on him either. There was no marks on on Butler. So I think that was a load of bullshit. I think it was just another sub story. He literally got in his car and drove, and he drove made them phone calls to his girlfriend, made the phone calls to his mother and ended up in the UCLA medical place and said like he was suffering with the disorder and he's struggling and they took him in. Um, and that's when the police found the car at, at the medical centre. So, uh, I mean, the fact he even attempted arson as well, he actually attempted to set the place on fire. So it just covered up his track. So, you know, in a way, he must have had some sort of mindset. Maybe he literally switched off hitting someone in the head over... 30 times and then finally switched on and realised what he was doing. I really don't know. I mean, I, I don't un I understand bipolar in aspects, but, you know, not really. I suppose you could do it. It sounds a bit more psychotic than bipolar, to be honest with you. So, uh, it's just dreadful. It really is. It really is dreadful. Now, Butler did finally plead guilty on March the 27th, 2006 and was sentenced on April the 5th to nearly 30 years in prison for the murder of Sam Kellerman. Butler was ordered to pay $17,850 in funeral expenses to the Kellerman's family, $10,000 to the State Victims' Compensation Fund, and $11,882 to the owner of the victim's apartment, which was left torched and blood-soaked after the killing. Now, prosecutors claim that Butler, the only suspect in the case, reportedly struck Kellerman in the head with a hammer, then torched Kellerman's Hollywood, California apartment in an attempt to cover up. Now, Jane Robinson, a spokeswoman for the district attorney's office, said it's possible Mr. Kellerman asked him to move out or there was a disagreement over how long he could stay with him and it resulted in him picking up a hammer. The judge called it a slaughter. And James Butler remains in prison today and at the moment he's not up for parole until 2036. So he's still sat there in prison today rotting away for, for that crime. And I, I'm glad because... I felt sorry for James at the beginning of the episode. I really did feel sorry for him. And, I, I, you know, I looked at it as Sam Kellerman was this this sort of guardian angel sent, sent to him to help his life out. And this is how he repays him, by murdering him and then trying to cover it up. To me, that just makes him an utter scumbag. Bipolar or non-bipolar, he's just a scumbag for me. Absolute scumbag. Now, their trainer, Ness, blamed himself for what had happened and in Ness's own words, he said, this is my fault. If it wasn't for me, James would have never met Sam. And all of this never would have happened. That's, that's so sad. Them words are so sad to read out. Because that poor trainer, Ness, 
It's basically saying this, none of this would have ever happened, but you can't blame yourself for that because what Sam Kellerman was doing was of his own accord. He was out there to help a guy who needed help and to help him push his career on, and that's exactly what he did. He helped him for the most part of his adult life, and it's just a shame that the way it's all ended up, and of course, Max had something to say on the matter, and he said this about his beloved brother, and he said, Sam was life's protagonist. Imagine the smartest, most intelligent person you know in the world. Then imagine the person you love the most. That's the guy. That's my brother. Well, what, what words? I mean, there's so many. I mean, when, when you describe Sam Kellerman's life, I mean, the guy was a future star. He could have been a, he could have been anything, couldn't he? He could have been anything he wanted. He was, you know, one out of 10,000. I mean, what a fantastic... I always think that's just brilliant from the teacher, what, what he wrote there. An amazing report. And, and everybody was affected. I mean, even, you know, Ness struggling with it, blaming himself. The family were cut up. Uh, Max's friends as well and relatives, they feared for him and his career and his marriage and and f- for his life at that time. And, and people were saying to him, don't let this be a double homicide. You know, his pal, producer Bill Wolf, who actually told him, don't let this guy kill you both. And Max actually spent 12 days off of his show which was IMAX, uh, and then and his crew were in tears watching him in his attempt to compose himself on the first day back. Somehow, he got half an hour onto the tape and, and, and Fox basically cancelled the uh, struggling show five months later. And Mac, he barely cared. He didn't, he didn't really care at all. It was just an awful time for Max. I mean, we know now, you know, he's managed to move on, but he doesn't talk about this. You know, people mention it. You've, I've seen... I was trying to find some more information from Max and to see if he spoke about it recently. It's not something he will speak about public. So that's probably why people may not know this story. And I don't think people knew what how great Sam could be. You could have been Sam and Max sitting in HBO or Showtime or whatever, and literally that they could have been together running the show. And by the sounds of it, they would have done a fantastic job because of their... It is, it's just amazing knowledge and... Sam, I mean, what a lovely guy. And going back to James, I mean, there's no remorse. There's, this guy is an absolute monster, an absolute asshole. He deserves to work in prison for what he did. You can hit someone once and possibly accept it as once. He's just, he's just lost it for a split second. Something that he'd done in the ring against Richard Grant, which was a, another inex- inexcusable thing. They've backed him all the way for him to then do that to Sam after him taking him in as well. I mean, it's just dreadful. But to smash someone's head in for th- over 30 times... I dread to think what the crime scene looked like. I mean, from what another, you know, the other analysts on it, I was going to put it in, but you know what? I think you actually get the gist of, you could just imagine if you get your head smashed in with a blunt object like a hammer for 30 times. I don't need to go into details about what that crime scene exactly looked like. Absolutely just dreadful. I think the best way to end this episode really is to kind of celebrate the achievements of of Sam Kellerman and what he did in in his short life. Twenty nine years of age. If he would have been alive today, God knows what he would have been doing and and how far he would have got in his career. But look at what he did in the time that he was on this planet. Look at you know the the, the way he was so empathetic and caring towards generally hu- the human race. Uh, the, 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 the obviously the, the relationship he had with his brother Max and the way Max has been able to go forward with his life even after this event and, and make such a brilliant career and we know Max today is one of the the best pundits in boxing he's one of the most respected ones he's the one that says it how it is he's one of the most unbiased ones as well and he's one that I really enjoy looking at his commentary hearing what he has to say because a lot of it is very unbiased and very objective and that is exactly what a boxing pundit or commentator should be so the way he's moved on in his career even after this tragic event in his life losing his brother is is amazing to see and amazing of, of the impact you know what Sam Kellerman actually had on the world in the time that he was on it so I, I only really want to end it on, on, on that note really rather yeah. than look at the negative side and, and, and obviously what James Butler Jr. did he's now in prison he'll rot there for the rest of his life hopefully or whatever may happen to him will happen but he doesn't deserve to get out for what he's done he should have he should have been given complete life imprisonment for that and I'm, I'm surprised he didn't push for that to be honest with you but for, for Sam Kellerman this is a guy that was an absolute hero a guy that had so much empathy for people and just a credit a credit to the human race what a guy an absolute legend of a man and we've really enjoyed going through and, and retelling 
a lot of Sam Kellerman's life and the relationship he had with Max, telling the story, as graphic as it is, as as shocking as it is in moments, the, the light out of the, this dark tunnel of this episode is obviously Sam Kellerman, and it's been a pleasure to, to sit down and really go through this story. It's something that I personally didn't really know too much about, probably because of, of what you said, Johnson, about how it's not really spoken about that much. Yeah, it isn't, and it's just definitely something... You, we're doing a dark side of boxing, it perfectly fit the bill, and I didn't know too much about James Butler Jr., to be fair. It wasn't until that Richard Grant incident that sort of, you know, I'd seen it sort of a few years ago, a couple of years ago. I never see it live, so yeah, I, I was I was a bit like you, I was a bit caught unawares of it, and then from there, that is when I realised that he had killed someone, and then to find out that he killed Sam, it was just crazy. And to find out about Sam, I never knew about Sam Kellerman, and by the sounds of it, as you quite rightly say, what what an incredible guy he was, at, you know, life taken at 29 years of age. The guy had the world as his oyster, and, 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 and credit to Max as well. And another, I mean, we could have gone into literally the Kellerman's family tree, because, I mean, <laughs> I'm not even joking, uh, Gary Smith of Boxing Illustrated, Go and check it out from the vault, the archives. It's a fantastic article that Gary Smith's put together. I really would suggest if anyone wants to really know in depth details about the Kellermans, we try to concentrate on just James Butler and touching on Sam. They actually, you know, their their grandmother fled from the Nazis and almost, you know, that their family were, were a part of the tragic events that happened to the Jewish community. So, she got away and that was where their life began and, and that's where Sam used to listen to the stories from his nan and his and his and his granddad or and, and that, that is what inspired him. So from that tragedy he he, he become this fantastic person. A tragic story really is a bad one. One unfortunately that we've got to tell on these dark side of boxing. If you've enjoyed listening to this particular episode of The Darker Side of Boxing, please let us know on social media. You can tweet us at darker underscore side underscore pod or send us a DM if you've got any thoughts or feelings on this episode. Or, of course, if there's any stories out there that we've not covered already, you'd like us to investigate and like us to cover for it. If you've not checked us out on Facebook, you can do so by checking out the BTR Boxing Podcast Network Facebook page. Now, for all the patrons out there that have been supporting us over the past few months we want to say thank you to rob evans we want to say thank you to tyler dennett and we want to say thank you to benjamin waters all three of them in particular have been supporting the darker side of boxing and the btr boxing podcast network so thank you to you guys as always for supporting the podcast if you want to become a patron like them please go and check us out on patreon dot com forward slash btr boxing podcast network for all the available tiers getting access to episodes earlier than the general public you can get a shout out on social media and on the podcast and you can even commission an episode for one of the podcasts on the network fight fans if you've enjoyed it of course again let us know we really appreciate the feedback we hope you have enjoyed listening to this episode about the curse of james butler jr and the heroes that were the Kellermans.